Uh, details on the major encounter in Jammu and Kashmir in which five Indian Army soldiers, uh, including two officers and three Jawans, have, have lost their lives. Very, very sad indeed. Um, let's bring you details of this encounter. It is um, in, uh, uh, the, in the larger Rajori area. Two Army captains have been killed in action. Three Army Jawans have lost their lives. Uh, the terrorists were on the run since the 19th. The Army launched the operation on the 20th. The operations took place in Ziarat Mal, in Gulabgar, that's a forest area, and its adjoining Solaki area. It was uh, conducted about three kilometers from a place called Kalakot. The terrorists were believed to be hiding in the shelters uh, of the graziers. On the 22nd of uh, November, in other words, yesterday, uh, Captain M. V. Pranjal of 63 RR, that's the unit, he came under fire from terrorists. At the time, he was speaking to a woman, uh, inquiring about uh, whether there were uh, you know, terrorists around or if there were strange people around when he was attacked. He sustained a serious gunshot injury, tragically uh, not surviving that, but subsequently. When he was shot, Major D.S. Mehra of Nine Para attempted to rescue Captain Pranjal. Uh, Major Mehra drew fire in his direction. He too was shot. And when the situation started getting even worse, Captain uh, Shubham Gupta, Havaldar Majid and Lance Naik bished intervened all in the effort of getting out their uh, injured partners. The terrorists at this stage were engaged and cornered and there was an active gun battle. The three Jawans, the two, one, one officer and two Jawans, Gupta, Majid and Bisht, received fatal gunshot injuries as they went in. Major Mehra, uh, who uh, they were trying to rescue at this stage, um, has fortunately made it out. He is stable. Another interesting and, and uh, worrying aspect of all of this is that overnight, between the 22nd and the 23rd, Pakistan attempted to fly in drones. They did fly in drones to drop arms and ammunition for terrorists. This would essentially be ammunition, perhaps small pistols as well. There are weight restrictions. The army foiled uh, this drone's resupply attempt. These were quadcopters which were sent in. Uh, at 7.30 a.m. this morning, the soldiers engaged one terrorist uh, and at 9 a.m. he was eliminated. A paratrooper, Sachin, of two para special forces uh, at this stage sustained fatal injuries. So five, he was the fifth and final soldier to have lost his life, killed in action. A second terrorist was hiding behind a sangar, which is a stone structure in the uh, forest. Uh, a jawan of nine para was injured in the gun battle to get this final terrorist. He was subsequently eliminated. In all of this, terrorists were firing from dominating heights. Visibility in the Gulabgarh forest, only three to four meters. Now, there are some details of the terrorist who was involved. The main terrorist has been identified as Kwadi, uh, a Pakistani Lashkar sniper and explosives expert. He was active in Rajori for over a year. He was involved in at least three terror incidents to this year uh, um, uh, itself. Let me go across right now to my colleague um, Nazir Masudi, who joins us for the very latest. You know, lots of details over there, Nazir. I think the key point is that this larger Rajori area, um, the forests of the Pir Panjal and the range itself has become a hotbed of terrorism. This wasn't the case even a few years back. Yeah, Vishnu. I'm here at Kalakut and a few kilometers from here where exactly encounter site was. And the encounter right now is poor, but the calming operation is on. Both the militants who were involved in yesterday's firing attack on the army have been killed, including Kari, as you have mentioned, one of the top Lashkar commanders who was operating here for last one year in Rajuri and trying to revive militancy. Uh, this is a tough area, as you said, uh, there was, you know, this shift of militancy from the plains of the valley to the mountains of Pir Panjal here. And there have been series of encounters and attacks on the security forces. Five soldiers, including three officers, two captains, and a JCU have been killed. Four of them are actually from the special forces. And this is the second biggest loss special forces have suffered in Rajuri this year. First, it was in May when five special forces or, or Jawans, you know, soldiers were killed. And in today's encounter also, four special forces Jawans have been killed. It is the force which has been launching relentless operation in the thing forest very difficult terrain and flush of militants and they have killed large number of militants and most of these operations are being jointly carried out by the army and the Jammu and Kashmir police. 
in this difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. Remember, this area was free from militancy since 2003. Perhaps uh, the security agencies can learn from lessons how it was made free from militancy in 2003, how the people, local population actually helped security forces openly to completely free this place from militancy. But after more, almost two decades, we see militancy is back in this area with much more, you know, uh, you know, trained and highly, you know, indoctrinated and heavily armed militants coming from Pakistan and carrying out these attacks. And importantly, that in most of the in encounters we have seen, militants are actually choosing the place of their encounter. Yes. And that's why the security force are suffering the casualties. These encounters can happen mostly in the jungle areas, mountain jungles, where they have a location advantage. And that is why security force suffer casualty. And also how security force, this is another example, officers leading from the front. They are not pushing the jawans in front in the line of fire. No, and that's always officers been, uh, that's always been uh, the exactly. case. And, 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 you know, so, which is why there's this disproportionate number of officer casualties. We've seen it in wars uh, in the past as well. Uh, exactly. Nazir, uh, thanks very much for sharing all those points with us. We've got uh, General D.S. Huda with us and uh, S.P. Ved. Uh, Mr. Ved was the former Director General of uh, Police in Jammu and Kashmir. Two of the, I would say, some of the two of the finest people to assess the state of terrorism um, and the threat we face. General Huda, um, could you tell us a little bit about the terrain that these soldiers were operating in? What makes um, you know, an encounter in this area particularly challenging? Uh, so I think as uh, Nazir also, you know, brought out uh, Vishnu, uh, the terrain here is quite different from what you see in the valley. So the valley is largely, uh, you know, quite plain. Uh, and in this area, you're on the foothills of Pir Panjal. And the terrain is extremely, extremely broken, difficult. Uh, what has also happened, Vishnu, is uh, that uh, in the last couple of years, uh, troops from here have thinned out. So, uh, you know, Uniform Force, which used to operate in this area, uh, has got pushed into eastern Ladakh. So there is also a little thinning out of troops uh, in the, in this area. So that makes it uh, a little more difficult to operate for the number of soldiers uh, that are here. And uh, really, I mean, uh, you know, General, I'm interrupting you because a, that's just such a key point. The uniform force, such an important anti-terrorism outfit, which was deployed in this area because of the threat we face on the China front moved out over there, a vacuum is created and terrorists move in. And you know, this feeds into a, a, our larger concern that if we are facing a threat on two fronts, it can include terrorism in areas where we had handled it. Right now, we've got a hole in a very large territory that we need to, to sort of sort out. So Vishnu, just to be, uh, just to be fair and uh, you know, when, uh, when the army would have considered moving additional troops to uh, to eastern Ladakh. Now, the fact is that at that time, the Jammu region and this whole area was very calm. Yeah. And uh, that may have gone into, uh, you know, the, the decision that we need to move out and where do we sure. pull out sort of troops from. So that that would be the reason. I think the, the larger issue and I think what Nazir has also brought out is uh, we need to go a little into depths of uh, Jammu region, which was calm, and I have commanded my uh, my corps in, in Jammu region in 2013-14, and then of course later Northern Command. Uh, things were things were quiet, and I think we need to go a little more into depth of why is it that this region has sort of hotted up. Uh, we had we had a huge support of locals in this area, and uh, they were also the ones that helped us in pushing back terrorism from Jammu region. And uh, we need to, I think, re-establish that sort of link with the local population, uh, the Gujar, Bakarwal that were there, and you know, who inhabit the high reaches of Peet Punjal, where these terrorists are not operating. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a number of issues, I think, that we, that we need to look at uh, Vishnu when we, when we see uh, what has been a revival of terrorism in the Jammu region. Sure. Mr. Ved, there was this attempt... Um, to rearm these two terrorists using quadcopters. They would have probably carried a little bit of ammunition. But this use of drones uh, from Pakistan, uh, you know, it, it's a frightening addition to this battle against terror because we've seen this being used in different contexts. 
not only in Jammu and Kashmir, but also on the Punjab front. Um, what sort of threat does this represent? Good evening, Vishnu. Mm. See, uh, the use of drones we have been seeing for the last uh, few years, particularly on the international border and in Punjab, uh, and uh, uh, how these uh, drones are being used to airdrop uh, small weapons like pistols, uh, even consignment of drugs uh, to finance the terrorism. A uh, lot of drugs are also dropped. Uh, see, uh, earlier, uh, I recall a few years back, we used to focus on uh, uh, the, the uh, transborder smugglers uh, who used to get uh, and the guides who would guide the infiltrating uh, group of terrorists. Uh, and most of the times they used to use uh, the transborder smugglers. But then uh, this new dimension of uh, drones has actually uh, brought a new dimension. Uh, how uh, somebody uh, can uh, send a drone, have a consignment of weapons uh, and the drugs dropped. But you need somebody inside to pick up that consignment. Somebody within my uh, my territory yep. who, who uh, otherwise this consignment will have no meaning. Now, even this attempt of uh, today morning, of rearming, yes. of, yeah, of uh, dro uh, dropping uh, the consignment, uh, uh, somebody need need to have picked up that and and uh, brought it to the uh, terrorists. So uh, I think that there there is an element of some enemy within within us that. Uh, I think the local police needs to look look into who are such people helping such terrorists uh, operating in our area. I think uh, that aspect needs to be taken particularly by the local police. Yeah. Um, General Huda, you know, it's been, um, if you look at uh, the, the, the state of militancy or terrorism and attacks in Kashmir, it's obviously gone down now for the last few years. But we see a relatively high number of uh, of officer casualties september 2023 two army officers one Jam jammu and kashmir police dsp killed in anantnag august 2023 three army personnel died during an encounter may 2023 five army personnel uh, were killed as well um, and now in uh, and earlier in april five army personnel died um, so in september there were two army officers who died as i mentioned that included a colonel and now you've got two young captains who've lost their lives. Do you believe that if you just look at it from an individual encounter standpoint, these numbers of casualties, officers and men, is disproportionately high? Uh, look, uh, Vishnu, you know, every every loss is tragic. You know, sometimes people think that uh, army officers who've seen these tragedies up close would get sort of immune to it. Uh, but frankly, that's just not the case because... Uh, you see this loss uh, so closely. Uh, you see the you see the tragedies that occur. You see uh, you know the grief that it brings to the family. Uh, it really hurts hurts us. So when we see uh, officer casualties, soldier casualties, uh, it's it's a tragic loss, uh, Vishnu. As far as uh, officer casualties are concerned, uh, look. I know, I know, I know. It's tragic when you're losing losing officers, but the fact is, uh, it should also hearten us that uh, there are officers who are leading up front. They're leading from the front, and that's exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, and in some ways, it sort of strengthens, uh, you know, the the ethos of the army that uh, officers are taking as much risk as as the soldiers are are taking. Yeah. So I I don't think it's sort of uh, Abnormal. If you if you look at the history of casualties in the Indian Army, uh, officers comprise about four percent of the total strength, but the number of casualties uh, have always been in the range of ten percent of casualties. So, uh, I would say hats off to these young officers. Um, my heart really goes out to to the families, but hats off to the young officers who are actually leading these operations and doing. And I, Vishnu, as you brought out. Uh, a number of these casualties were caused in trying to rescue their comrades. And this trust and comradeship that is alive in the Indian Army is something uh, that really we must be proud of. 
and uh, as i said yes uh, yes there are losses uh, but i take heart in the fact that the basic ethos of leadership in the indian army is intact krishna yeah. uh mr ved you know we've seen um, over the last couple of years in fact over the last one year the um, the ib the la the loc being generally quiet uh, that constant uh, bombardment on both sides hasn't really taken place we've seen the relative uh, the valley being relatively quiet and this particular area with serious terrorist influences really building up uh, one of the terrorists over here was pakistan he was known to be pakistani uh, lashkar do you believe that uh, there is a significant entry of, of um, pakistani terrorists into our territory through the peer panjal Vishnu, it's definitely uh, the Pakistani elements who are operating here. Uh, I don't think there is local terrorist uh, in the Rajouri Punch area, and uh, they are, as far as uh, providing local logistic support, there could be people. After all, uh, if terrorists are operating for a longer period of time, they need uh, uh, food items. They need. Uh, Uh, at um, other other uh, essentials you may have a stock up for about 10 days or 15 days but you can't last for months together so somebody may be taking at the gun point uh, a, a, a goat or a sheep from grazer in the forest um, could be procured on gun point but then uh, lo as far as my knowledge goes this very little local uh, involvement of youth it is primarily those pakistan uh, based terrorist who have been infiltrated in this belt knowing pretty well that it's very near to the loc it has uh, foot hills of the uh, peer panchal uh, and uh, uh, there are sufficient spaces and dense forest area to hide and to draw the forces so that they can inflict maximum damage to the Uh, indian army and uh, uh, police and security forces that is their main aim and that's what they are trying to do uh, as far as uh, i completely agree with uh, general huda uh, in the highest traditions of uh, indian army the, it's led by its uh, uh, officers but pakistan forge it cannot face indian army it is basically it has outsourced all this uh, this kind of uh, war to these disposable terrorists so they are able to inflict uh, damage to the indian army through these uh, uh, these terrorists who who are uh, in any way disposable for pakistan army right. pakistan army is able to achieve uh, what it actually cannot do on its own their generals are enjoying uh, back home i think we need to come out with a policy to inflict damage to these Pakistani generals who are actually doing it. Yeah, um, General Huda, uh, if you just look at the tactics which have been used, ambushes have been frequently used over the last one year. There was that horrific ambush uh, of an army truck. Uh, this was presumably some sort of an ambush operation as well. This entire effort of bringing in our soldiers into areas where the visibility is just three to four meters in a jungle, uh, you know, you, and and having the um, the tactical advantage in being you know in a position to fire first um what sort i mean you, the army is trained special forces are trained to deal with this sort of thing but how does this represent um you know perhaps a, a greater danger than operations or encounters which we've seen elsewhere over the last few years uh, so vishnu you know this is a this is a cat and mouse game uh, between the security forces and the terrorists so if they find that they are not gaining advantage in some area uh, they will obviously attempt uh, to shift you know the the area of operations and and do what maximum damage uh, they can do i think we need to look at the sort of overall perspective and see our security forces operation succeeding and you mentioned that uh, you know violence is down uh, and uh, look vishnu i mean this is this is a long hard and unfortunately often brutal fight and setbacks are going to happen uh, we might wish that they don't uh, what tactics are employed what exactly went down in this area what were the circumstances uh, 
in each encounter the enemy is different the terrain is different the situation is different and uh, if there have been some tactical mistakes i'm sure the army is uh, going to learn from them just as uh, just as they have in the past uh, you mentioned now uh, you know earlier terrorists used to operate uh, within the population for example in south kashmir uh, today they have graduated to the high reaches uh, to more remote areas uh, i am sure the army is going to learn its uh, lessons from whatever has happened and modify its tactics accordingly let me tell you uh, vishnu the special forces soldiers are extremely highly trained uh, one mistake or setback if they've had they're going to learn from it uh, similarly 63 rr is a hugely experienced unit in counterinsurgency operations in this area i i'm sure they will bounce back from it yeah uh mr ved one final question to you in terms of the operations of the terrorists themselves and we've seen an evolution over the years maybe about 10 12 years back you would have the odd person trying to come across with an ak47 a little bit of ammunition then they started using communication more effectively uh, a command and control structure through uh, communication which was brief uh, uh, sometimes you know i mean that was used we've seen them use in high altitude passes on occasion skis to actually get across um now drones are being used and these appear to be very hardened fighters and trained fighters uh, do you believe uh, mr ved that you know the terrorists that we are facing now are more dangerous in terms of their operations than what we faced by and large a few years back definitely vishnu uh, see today they are using communication which is very difficult to intercept there was a time when we could uh, get uh, uh, through intercepts it's not no more possible very very difficult uh, uh, the kind of equipment they are using they are uh, they, they purchase things off the shelf unlike government uh, whether it is army or police we have to go through the process government processes to procure uh in fact uh, if i go back to 90s i remember how uh, those days we had uh, walkie talkies and uh, they had latest japanese sets so uh, uh, how things have evolved over the years and then internet based communication and uh, all kind of as you said uh, e- 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 today uh, drones they are uh, basically uh, putting um, the use of technology only to harm you and that is what they are able to do i think uh, we we uh, have to uh, devise our own ways and uh, means to counter it we are doing in fact those who are operating on the ground uh, army units or police units are uh, obviously uh, facing these uh, uh, these challenges Absolutely. but uh, yes pakistan has been using Uh, i have seen even in, in the on the fence uh, initially as i said uh, they used to use uh, transporter smugglers to cross then they started tunneling then they started uh, when fence was constructed they started underground tunneling of the fence then they started using when uh, the fence was electrified they started using plastic ch- uh, stairs then came the drones so it, these these technologies have been evolving And night vision and night vision equipment as well. Night vision, yeah. all all kind of uh, equipment. All right, well, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for speaking to us uh, to to put perspective on what we are seeing. And I think General Huda's words are important. It's not going away; it's here, and we have to face it. And there are challenges, and we need to be ready as a nation to constantly go through this battle. Thank you very much. We'll take a short break at this stage. Come back for a little more.